Um, I don't know if many of you know too much about Freemasonry in general. Um, um, two sides to it. Um, there was the what they called the ancients and the moderns. Now, um, Cagliostro was mixed up with the ancients, and um, we kind of feel that he was, although he was um, a very benevolent man, he was also involved in an awful lot of political things as well at the time. We had um, his friendships revolved around um, George III's sons, his brothers, and they were all involved in Freemasonry. And it was a very difficult time politically as well. So although he was seen to be a very benevolent man, we think that there was possibly a gender in what he was doing, um, and that that was possibly the overthrow of um, the French monarchy. He was involved in many things in France. He got involved in something called the Diamond Necklace Affair, which I don't, again, I don't know if you know much about, but um, it was a, a plot to overthrow Marie Antoinette. And um, so after that happened, he was thrown in the Bastille. Um, he then was exiled from France and came over to England, whereby he tried to set up his Egyptian ritual in place of English Freemasonry. And unfortunately, that failed miserably. And um, he was ridiculed by the English press. They did everything they could to try and ruin his reputation. And unfortunately, all the good work that he had done as a healer and prophet and alchemist was unraveled. Um, but from the point of view that in the book, we don't try to prove one way or the other whether he was this shady character of Joseph Balsamo or whether he was this benevolent healer and um, incredibly talented master of magic. I think we kind of leave that up to the reader to work out for themselves. He is very much a kind of, I suppose you'd call him a Marmite character. You either love him or you hate him. It's very hard to find um, a balance in between, but that's one thing that we you know, really wanted to do with the book. The whole process towards the end of his life, whereby he was um, condemned by the Inquisition, he made a really bad mistake. While he was in England, like I said, he, he was um, equally revered and equally condemned. Um, that it got to the point where he was being spied upon by the French government, he was being spied upon by the English government. He was in a position whereby he was in a very, you know, sort of um, precarious position. And he fled to Switzerland. And then he made probably the biggest mistake of his life. The Roman church wanted him. Practically everybody wanted him at that precise moment. He was persona non grata. But he, in his own head, decided that the Catholic Church might want to take on his ritual. That they may wish to be enlightened enough to um, think that they too could be rejuvenated, that he could rejuvenate the Catholic Church. And people egged him on. They basically said, you know, yes, come to Rome. And the Catholic Church were, hmm, maybe we will take you on. So he went to Rome. And after attempting to set up his Egyptian ritual in Rome, they arrested him and his wife. He was tortured, and she was also um, severely beaten and tortured. And it was at that point that he lost the, um, pretty much lost the will to live. He was to be condemned to death, but they decided not to. Apparently there was a mysterious figure that turned up and had his um, death sentence commuted to life in prison. He was then transferred to San Leo in Tuscany, whereby he continued to attempt to, um, 
send out his message of rejuvenation through his visitors. Um, gradually, he went slightly mad and died a very horrible death in 1795. Um, there are rumours that he escaped and disappeared to India and that became you know, a shadowy spiritual figure. But I think it's highly unlikely. I think the poor chap probably just uh, died a very broken man. We've never found his body. He was buried, um, according to the uh, Inquisition, at the foot of the hill, um, at the bottom of the castle. One thing that I always wished that I could do was try and convince them to go and, you know, looking for the coordinates that they'd actually given to actually find out where his grave is. But um, they weren't very receptive to my request to um, look for his body or even to issue an apology for the treatment that they gave him. Um, so his life was one of misery and one of enlightenment as well. And hopefully he found enlightenment at the end of that misery. But um, we'll never quite know who he was, what he was, but we are left with the legacy, which is this incredible ritual. And like I said, if it hadn't have been for the people that disliked him so much, we would never have known so much about him. And um, there is a huge amount of interest in him still, mainly because he is such an enigma. His immense knowledge of ancient teachings led him to find, found his rite of Egyptian masonry, whereby he claimed that his followers could reach a state of spiritual perfection. Now, of course, not only did this upset most of the regular Freemasons at the time, it also really upset the, the Catholic Church, um, because, of course, you weren't meant to be able to reach a state of enlightenment or perfection without a priest. Um, he was also a healer and um, a spiritual master and a mystic. And he traveled throughout Europe, um, fleeting between all the different countries and mingling with uh, wealthy patrons, kings, emissaries. And um, he had letters of official con commendation which followed him on his travels. And several very well healed dignities were indebted to him and became his sponsors. His mystical sciences were popular amongst genteel society, and his clairvoyant prophecies were uncannily accurate, often to the dismay of the recipient. Deified by some and condemned by others, it didn't take long for the tide to turn against him. And this is where there is two sides to the story. On one side, he was born in 1743 in Palermo in Sicily to uh, not a poor family, but a, a comfortably off family. Um, he was sent to a seminary where he was taught by the local priest. He got into trouble. Um, he decided that he was going to um, attempt to swindle a local man and um, everything went wrong and he was sent away. Um, the other story is that he, in fact, was um, an orphan and a prince of Trebizond um, and had been taken in by a benefactor who was a prince himself. Now, these stories were equally bandied about at the time. Nobody actually really knew who he was, and that's part of the intrigue, is that was he Joseph Balsamo? The forger and con man from Sicily, or was he Count Alessandro Cagliostro, Prince of Trebizond and student of Grandmaster Pinto in Malta? So he got around, he went, he literally went everywhere. And according to his stories, he'd been to Egypt and uh, been into the Great Pyramid. On great reflection, we don't actually think that was probably true because. Um, one of the earliest documented uh, travellers to 
uh, Egypt was in 1789. So we think that if he had been there, he would also have been um, the kind of guy that would have carved his name into the walls. If you go to Egypt now, in many of the temples, you have many of the travellers' signatures. Um, I know it's classed as vandalism now, but uh, uh, we have Belzoni, the great showman and uh, also a Freemason. But I truly believe that if Cagliostro had been there, he'd have put his name everywhere. He was the kind of guy that would um, be quite happy to leave his mark wherever he went. But that does not detract from the fact that he knew his stuff. The legend of where he got the material from to create his um, Egyptian rite, we don't know. Again, there's stories about it. He said himself that he found a manuscript in a bookshop, um, which I'm sure we'd all like to have you know, sort of stumbled across something like that. I think it was probably more likely that he um, was under the tutorship of a man called Rabbi Samuel Haim. Um, and he was the Bel Sham of, of uh, the Bel Shem of London, and he was um, basically a rabbi who was um, a Kabbalist and very involved in many magical practices. Cagliostro was a student of his. He was also a follower of Swedenborg, who was also another Freemason who was involved in. Uh, Christian magical practices. Around that time there was so much blending of traditions um, that it's very difficult to actually work out you know where a lot of these teachings actually came from. So in some respects um, his Egyptian ritual was um, something that we, we'd never seen before within Freemasonry.